I'm reminded of a story that uh, happened to, oh, 75, 80 years ago or so. And, uh, it was kind of passed down from uh, from one generation to the next. And so today's the day to pass it on to this to this generation. Um, out, in a, out in the country, there was a little country church. And they had had weather just like what we're having today. And it was, it was snowing pretty bad. And on a healthy Sunday, they normally ran about 50 to 60. And on this particular day, there's only one one of the old gentlemen well, you know, walked seven seven miles in the snow to get to church on that, that particular day. And, and the preacher was there. So they were sitting there in front of the, you know, front of the sanctuary talking about, well, how are we going to do church today? It's just me and you. And he said, well, let's just, just go ahead and do church. He said, well, are you sure? I mean, it's just me and you. He said, no, you go right ahead and we'll just, we'll just go ahead and do this. And so he walked right down here on the front row and the preacher got up and, you know, they sang a couple songs and had their communion and then they came into the sermon time. And by golly, that was one of the best sermons a preacher had ever given. And it would come I mean, in about 45, 50 minutes long. And at the end of that, he said, how was that? He said, well, just because I'm the only one here doesn't mean you have to give me the whole meal. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we, we live in a day and age where, where scripture is hard for us to understand. In this particular passage that we're going to take a look at today in Isaiah chapter 6, it's one of these things that it's like, God, why don't you make it easy? <laughs> you know, why does God hide things and, and give us information to make us go search for it? I mean, we live in an information age, don't we? You want to know something, we type, we type it into the computer, or we type it in on the iPad, Wikipedia comes up, and well, we can know what somebody knows about it, right? <laughs> and so it's hard for us to grasp why does God hide things from us in his word. In Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah is, is having this vision and, and it's where Isaiah is commissioned by God to be his spokesman. In Isaiah chapter 6, it starts off this way that you know, when Isaiah is giving this first hand recount, he said in the year the Lord, excuse me, in the, in the year that King Isaiah died, I saw the Lord seated on the throne. He was high and exalted and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above them were seraphs, each with six wings, and with two wings they covered their faces, with two wings they covered their feet, and with two they were flying, and they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who's, who the whole earth is full of his glory. And at the sound of the voices of the seraphs, the doorposts and the threshold shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. And Isaiah found himself in the presence, in the throne room of the creator of the universe. And it was here he realized how unworthy and how unclean he was to be there. <clears throat> he says, woe to me, I cried. I am ruined. For I'm a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. And almost as to pause there, you can almost write in his next, you know, if you're trying to think for him or try to write that down in words. Here he is standing before God. Oh my goodness, woe is me. I have seen this. I am here. No one can see the face of God and live. And he knows at that moment there's something that's going to happen. Either God's going to take his life for being there or something was going to change. As Isaiah tells his account, one of the seraphs picked up with a tongue, a hot coal and brought it over and touched it to his lips. Now, this is kind of where I try to understand the story because I'm thinking, you know, there are just some things that you don't do. And, you know, putting hot coals on one lip, I would think, would be right up there at the top. A number of years ago, we had, when I say we, I had grown some um, how, you know, habanero peppers and was trying to make a habanero sauce. So I'm sitting there by the, you know, by the sink and I'm cutting them. And sometimes habaneros, they squirt this, you know, little bit of juice out and one drop, one drop hit me right here on the lip. Now I'm not sure if you've ever been tempted to cuss. <laughs> but that was enough to get a preacher to almost do that that day. And it's like, oh my goodness, this thing's hot. And what happened? 
is that when the seraph touched his lips with that coal, he said, see, your guilt is atoned for and your sin is removed. I got that backwards. Yeah, guilt is removed, sin is atoned for. Sorry about that. He says, your guilt is removed and your sin is atoned for. Now, let's just stop right here for just a moment as we're in the throne room of God. And we're standing there in our mind's eye with Isaiah. What are we seeing and what in the world is going on? And what does this coal have to do with anything? You see, there's something about the presence of God that God cannot have in his presence unclean things. Now, let's face it, you and I, human beings, we have sin. Oh, my goodness, we've got it. We can write a list of it down. How do we deal with our sin? How do we deal with our, uncleans or our, our, our uncleanness? And what happens when we find ourselves in the presence of God? How does this work? You see, the story here that Isaiah is experiencing, the story that Isaiah is sharing is this. Your guilt is removed. If you knew, if you were standing in Isaiah's shoes before the God of the universe, and here's a great big throne, and you know, he's got this, this train, and so his whole essence, this whole part of what he wears is all over the place, and you're seeing strange things and hearing strange things. Kind of like the last couple minutes of the Wizard of Oz. And you see this strange creature come over and say, now, your guilt is removed. Now, your sin is atoned for. Where do you stop? You see, to be in the presence of God, those two things must happen. It happened for Isaiah. It has to happen for you and I. Our guilt has to be removed. How many of you ever wrestled with guilt? Woke up or found that point in time in the day where it's like, oh my goodness, what in the world has just happened? And why am I responsible? Why do I feel bad? And why am I experiencing this whole thing that I'm experiencing? And then the God of the universe comes in and says, you know what? Your guilt take away. What also has to happen is not just the guilt is being removed, but sin is being atoned for. You see, there is an atonement for sin that happens throughout the Old Testament. And it's with the, the blood of sheep and the blood of lambs and the blood of rams and goats. And all this blood that cover up sin. All this blood that cover up sin. And at this one point in time, God in the presence here of, with Isaiah says, Your guilt is removed. Your sin is atoned for. This was not something that Isaiah had expected. And he finds himself in the presence of God. No guilt. No sin. And then this story changes in a moment. God said, who's going to go? Who is going to go and share the story that Isaiah just experienced? Who's going to go and give this story to the people? And you can almost hear, I, at this point when I read it, I, I see Isaiah. It's like, I'm, I'm here. It's me. Send me. I want to do this. It's me, me, me. Okay? You ever been to teachers? You know, you know class there to teachers? Like, uh, who has the answer? You, me and they, you know the answer. They call on somebody else. It's like, come on. You know they don't know the answer. <laughs> so I say, is there me, 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 me? And it's like, okay, here it is. This is your message. This is your story. You go and you tell it. Oh, by the way, they aren't going to see it. They aren't going to understand it. They won't hear it. They won't see it. Good luck with that. That's like, well, how do I do this then? Why is this stuff in? Wouldn't it be nice for God to say, Isaiah, go, tell them this. They will change their lives. And it's real easy. <laughs> but what happens and is that God says, you're going to go, you're going to talk to them, and they're going to have eyes, and they aren't going to see, and they're going to have ears, and they aren't going to understand, and they're going to have hard hearts, and they're going to reject it. Go. Anyway. 
Now it's interesting that this passage in Isaiah 6 is quoted in all four Gospels. For Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it's quoted with a parable. You remember the story of the farmer who had some seed, right? He went out and he grabs some seed and he throws it and some lands on the rocky ground, some lands with the thorns, and, and some lands on the good soil, and some, you know, some of the birds eat up. And that passage is, as Jesus is telling the story about the farmer and his seeds, everybody's like, oh yeah, that's deep, Jesus. Uh -huh. I completely don't get this story. And so his disciples come to him and they say, Jesus, can you explain this to us? Because we're rather, you know, human and we don't really quite get this. And in between Jesus telling the story and Jesus telling what it means to his disciples. Isaiah chapter 6 is quoted. For the very reason that Jesus did. Jesus told parables for this reason. Jesus told stories for this very simple reason. That they would see but not see. That they would hear but not really hear. And what Jesus did with the disciples is he took them over and he explained. He said, you know what? The seed is God's word. Oh, it's easy now, isn't it? And sometimes life shows up and it just gets choked out. Oh, I get it. And sometimes people have a hard time of changing their lives and it's just eaten up. And like, oh, I get it. And then there's the word that really takes root in a person's life and it creates a change. Oh, Jesus, that's... That's such a cool story. I mean, we all know the story. And it's all in this context that Jesus is hiding things in plain sight. In the book of John, it's a little bit different. In the book of John, here's what happens. Jesus has called out Lazarus' name from the grave. And Lazarus, who is dead, gets up and walks out. People were pretty upset about that. And in the context of Lazarus coming out of the grave, they were getting ready to kill Jesus. And it's in that context that John quotes Isaiah chapter 6. They will see, but they won't see. They'll hear, but they won't understand. And here it is. In the context, of what those things are hidden and those things that are covered up that God does is the resurrection and the word of God. There's a story that's being told. Here's the story. It's very simple when we break it down and I'm going to do the best I can with it, okay? But here's the story. The story that we get out of it is that where are you and I? You see, the story that Isaiah is seeing Guilt being removed, sin being atoned for, stories being told, Lazarus coming out of the grave is this. Jesus Christ at the cross removed your guilt, atoned for your sin. He died and rose again. Period. And that's the story that Isaiah Understood that he was telling. See, the church has one simple message. You want to be in God's presence, guess what? Your guilt has to be atoned for. Your sin has to be removed. You can't do it yourself. Jesus Christ is the only way to get it done. So why don't we get it? If it's that simple, if the message hasn't changed for all these years, why do we not? Well, the first thing is because of fear. Sometimes we're just afraid to get there. Over in John chapter 12, over in John chapter 12, there's a, a story that's, that's shared here. Um, and it was right after Lazarus was brought and right after Isaiah was quoted here. Um, John chapter 12, verse, verse 40 says, he has blinded their eyes and deadened their hearts so that they can neither, neither see with their eyes nor understand with their hearts or, nor turn and I would heal them. 
Isaiah said this because he saw Jesus' glory and spoke about him. Yet at the same time, even among the leaders, many believed in him, but because of the Pharisees, they would not confess their faith because they'd be put out in the synagogue. Because they love praise for men more than they love praise for God. So as Jesus did this thing with Lazarus and as Isaiah chapter 6 was quoted, here's what happened. People were afraid to take a stand for Jesus. <clears throat> Strangely enough, because they were going to get kicked out of God's presence. I mean, the synagogue, the Jewish synagogue was a place where you went and you learned about God and you experienced God there. Oh, by the way, if you want to have Jesus, you can't come back. <laughs> yeah, that's not a good thing for me. I mean, it's like, have you been kicked out of church for loving Jesus? <laughs> okay. In our, in our cultural context, that's what it's about. Okay. They would rather please God, or excuse me, they'd rather please men than please God. And so they were, some of them were afraid. Not just fear was a part of it, but they're really... There's a hardness of heart in Scripture, or even Isaiah 9 understands this. You see, there's a point in time where we've heard it all before, right? And we just really don't want to change. Now, I'm not sure if you can relate to this. But here it is. You know, we live in a world. We live in, we live in a world where we have a chance to live in America. Now, I'm not sure, if you're, for those of you who are maybe my age and a little bit older, you probably heard this growing up in school at some point in time. You can grow up to become what? President of the United States. Okay? And now we're thinking, now we're thinking, you know, wait, how many of us really think that Washington is irrelevant? <laughs> okay? The things that happen, we can live in our own little world and not really deal with. There's a disconnect, okay? And what is happening in America is that there is a hardening of our hearts, frankly, for good reason, because we don't trust what's going on. And so this whole thing that's happening in our life, and we can experience, oh, you know, guess what? The news says this today. It's like, oh my goodness, we don't believe the news anymore. Oh, this is happening. We hear it. Oh, really? Yeah, okay, whatever. And we all chalk it up to propaganda. What happened? Is it the real stories that we need to understand, even when they are told, we write them off too. And there's a hardness of heart that's happening. It's almost as if, for the Jews, they got so much of God, they couldn't stand anymore. <clears throat> Paul writes in Romans chapter 11, that there's a hardness in part of the Jews until the fullness of the Gentiles come. And then their hearts will be opened again. There's a hardness of heart for some of us. What happens, you know, we hear the message like, oh yeah, I've heard that. As it's been said to me, well, Larry, I'm glad that the Jesus thing works for you, but that's not for me. The sad thing is, is that we think that God is irrelevant. We think that this story is irrelevant and no longer is the church, no longer is God, no longer is a relationship with Jesus essential for us in our cultural context. Because what we've done, we've taken the church and we've made it about a whole lot of other things. Instead of keeping the simple message simple. And so what happens is that God gets lost in all the pop dinners and everything. You may remember this name, a gentleman by the name of Jim Baker. Okay? The uh, 700 Club. Remember, you know, it was once said by, by a gentleman that I know, so whenever I need cheering up, I watch two things that are fake, and that is either wrestling or church TV. Now you just ponder that for a second. He said, you will get a laugh out of either one of those two. Here's what happened. Um, Jim Baker had a lot of experiences in life. And one of the things that he decided to do is that he's going to create the Bible Disney World. Okay? Okay? We're going to have, you know, Samson's Barbershop. You know, I don't know exactly what all. 
but he had his whole plan. He said, we're going to have a Bible-based theme park, and that's going to be really cool. You know, you want to see the party of the Red Sea? We're going to do it. You know, he had all this whole thing, all, you know, rigged up. And what happened is that through some mistakes and through his own mistakes, he ended up in prison for a number of years. In, in his book called I Was Wrong, what his job was in prison was he became the, the janitor of the bathrooms. And so what he did for the years that he was in prison, every day he'd get up and they'd do their thing and then it time, came time for him to work and his job was being the janitor of the bathrooms. He's like, here I am, cleaning toilets, mopping floors. Cleaning toilets, mopping floors. Cleaning toilets, mopping floors, six years of cleaning toilets, mopping floors, okay? He said, as one day I was sitting there cleaning toilets and mopping floors, I realized something. I realized that I was so wrapped up in wrapping the package of Jesus Christ and giving it to the world and saying, Look at this. It's going to be great. It's wonderful. You can experience it. It's, oh, it's fantastic. And he said, what I discovered, mopping toilets, mopping floors and cleaning toilets, is that I got so wrapped up in the presentation of the package that I missed the gift. He said, I was so wrapped up in pointing out who Jesus Christ was that I never really experienced. He writes, on that day I saw for the first time my mistakes. You see, we think church, we think the Christian life is about a lot of things and it's not. Here's the last reason that we don't get it. It has to do with pride. And I believe this is the real crux of the matter. It really has to do with pride. The best way to describe pride in this understanding goes back to Daniel chapter. Daniel's an Old Testament prophet. He's hanging out with a king by the, by the name of King Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar had had some dreams, and he has a particular dream on one night. It's like, hey, Daniel, explain to me this dream. And Daniel says, you know what, king? He said, here it is. You had a, you had a dream about a tree. And the tree was great big, and you know, there's animals living underneath it. There's birds living in the, in the, in the nests and the, in the leaves and in the branches. And the tree gets cut down. He says, King, I hate to break it to you, but this is not a good dream. <laughs> because God is telling you what he's getting ready to do. He says, King, your, your, influence, you, you, your influence is felt all over the world. Nebuchadnezzar, your influence is felt all over the world. But here's what's going to happen. Your influence is going to get cut off. And you're going to go out and live like an animal for seven years. He says, King, if you just knowledge that God's in charge. And if you'll repent from your sin and renounce your wicked ways and turn towards God, please do that. Please do that. But what happens in Daniel chapter 4 is that King Nebuchadnezzar hears that and some time has gone by and King Nebuchadnezzar wakes up on one particular day. You know how that is. You know, oh my goodness, that's a good day. He's up. He's got his clothes on. He's taking a look at all of his stuff, you know. He says, it's a good day for me to be me. It's a good day for me to be king. I mean, look at everywhere my influence reaches. And that afternoon, he went mad. <laughs> he uh, got so crazy, it was written about in other passages outside the Bible that he had to change my have a nut, okay? He went out. His hair got so long and matted, it was nasty. Um, it, the, by Daniel describes it. He went out and ate grass like cattle. Now, you're having a good day, right? When you're not eating grass. <laughs> it says that his fingernails got so long, they looked like a bird's claw, okay? Now, for these guys, that would be really cool. You know? And for some ladies, that would be really cool. But, 
This is what happened to Nebuchadnezzar. And it's talked about that his, he was sitting there so wrapped up in himself over those seven years. He didn't get it. Until in Daniel chapter 4, around verse 29 to 30, he writes, He looked up. He looked up. And he understood that God of the heavens was in charge. See, he thought he was pretty big stuff. And it was one of the things that he shares is that, you know, God is able to take prideful men and humble them. And he's able to take humble men and Nebuchadnezzar realized that God was in charge. And that's hard for us to really understand. Because there's a simple message. There's a simple message. For you and I to be in the presence of God requires that our guilt is removed and our sin is atoned for. And Jesus Christ did that at the cross. Isaiah knew what he was sawing and raised his hand and said, I want to go and tell the people. And when you understand what Isaiah wrote about Jesus Christ, all the prophecies that he wrote, all I mean, everything that he writes about Jesus comes true. Isaiah knew what he was describing. So where does that leave you and I today? You know, it leaves us with a very simple story. That we as a church must either repeat or grasp, or change. And it's this. We must be sure as Christians that we're not doing our Christian life for others. Okay? If you're living your Christian life for others to see, you probably got it wrong. It's just about you and Jesus. For us as a church, we have to make sure that we never get the story Second place. That the story of the redemption of Jesus Christ for human time is there every time we're together. It's the one thing that brings the church together. It's the story of Jesus Christ. His death, his burial, his resurrection, his virgin birth, his teachings. We we gotta be people of the book, people of the story. And last thing is for us to be thankful. I'm not sure what your traditional Thanksgiving uh, traditions are, okay? Every, every couple years, we, uh, we kick out our traditions um, and do something different. And this happens to be one of those years for us. Um, you know, we've done, we've done turkey, you know, most of the years. Um, a couple years ago, we discovered on Christmas Day not to do ham or not to do turkey or something like that. But up in north, we are up in Indiana, um, I get the garage door open, fire up the grill, and we cook steak. Strange thing. Our family's rather strange. So this week, I'm looking forward, okay? Grilling out steak for Thanksgiving. Okay? Changing things up a little bit. <laughs> thinking, man, that might be a pretty good idea, you know? <laughs> Some of you might be thinking that. If, if it is, grill it at your own house. You know, don't come on. <laughs> <laughs> we only got enough for us right now. So. Um, but anyways, it's one of these things that sometimes it's good to change up what we do, but we still keep the meaning the same. And here's what I want to challenge you with. I think we as Christians have a habit, especially at Thanksgiving, of stopping and saying, thank you, Jesus, for all the stuff you do for me. And I wonder what would happen if our Thanksgiving this week was this. Thank you, Jesus, for all the things you allow me to do for you. How is it that we share? How is it that we touch? How is it that we connect? Are we going to be people of the story? Here it is as we wrap this up. Isaiah saw his guilt removed, his sin atoned for, and it changed his life. My guess is that you have somebody that's close to you. And they wrestle with guilt. 
I have encountered people who have wrestled with guilt for a long time. And it's on their lips, it's in their hearts, it's in their words, it's in their body language, it's in their demeanor, and guilt is just so heavy. Maybe you or someone you know is dealing with a lot of guilt from life. If you have a chance, and when you have a chance this week to encounter people that you love, remind them, through Jesus Christ, your guilt is gone. It's removed. Set the burden down. Leave the baggage at the door. Don't carry it any further. You and I all know who we are when nobody's looking. There's those thoughts. There's those feelings. There's those, yeah, I bet you I could get away with that. Friends and I used to play bank robberies in high school. We can do that. This is how the mind, I mean, the human mind in its fallen nature just reverts to weird, strange, perverse stuff. And here's one. Because of Jesus Christ, that sin, our actions, our things that we think about, the way our mind wants to go, is, is atoned for. It's taken care of. And the blood of Jesus Christ cleans us completely. I love snow for this one reason. It reminds us that though your sins were red as scarlet, through Jesus Christ they are white as snow. Snow is a testimonial reminder to me that God says, you know what? All the murky mud and junk of life and all the stuff that doesn't matter, through Jesus Christ gets covered up and taken care of. Good thing to remember. Good things to be thankful for. Wherever you are today, if the Holy Spirit is calling you to do something different, do it today, will you? Leave away the guilt. Let your sin be taken care of at the cross. Don't be afraid of what some people think. Get rid of pride. Strip it away. Don't let your heart be hard. Because God wants us to see the story, experience the cross, understand the resurrection and what it did in our hearts and what it does in our lives. Would you please pray with me? Father God, we come to you today and we need to understand the very simple message that you have. And that is that you want to be with us and we can be with you when our guilt is removed and our sin is atoned for and you did that through your son Jesus Christ. You did it in such a way that it's through faith and grace and mercy redemption salvation. Father God let us never get so used to it that we Father God, let us not be afraid of experiencing your love. Let us put you first. Father God, break our hearts. Keep us humble. Remove our pride and remove ourselves from it. Where we, if we would just simply look to you and acknowledge that you are the God of heaven. And that you did what you promised. eternity is yours.